Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Especially this morning, wherever you are, whether you're watching in your office, study, or living room, I want to welcome you this wonderful Sabbath morning and um, invite you to come and worship with us from wherever you are. Uh, to those who are regular members as well as those who are visiting, we thank you that you tuned in and that you will be joining us this morning. I have a few Vespers this morning. Some of them are because of the times that we are in just make perfect sense. So there's no fellowship meal today and there will be no Vespers this evening. There won't be any prayer meeting this week um, during spring break week. So um, make sure you use this opportunity to take uh, some rest time. Uh, summer is going to be very, very busy. So save up on that energy and passion for ministry because uh, we are going to be doing quite a few things this summer. On that note, one of the things that will be happening this summer is the VBS program. And some of you may be hesitant to uh, call and sign up because you're thinking you don't have four or five evenings to help and participate. I can assure you as being part of it, uh, uh, being part of it last year, and I believe the year before that to some measure as well, that even if you're able to volunteer for just one or two of the days, there are certain duties, especially in the first two days on the Monday and Tuesday, uh, that make everything so much busy. And if you could help out just on those days, I know that Sue would be very eager to hear from you. So there is more information on that in the bulletin. You can find that online as well on our uh, webpage. But please, uh, if you're able to, uh, the dates, I believe, are... Does anyone know June? I have them here in the bulletin. It's June 29 to July 2nd. So June 29 to July 2nd. So pray about it and think about it. Tomorrow is the deadline for entering your application to stay on the campgrounds of camp meeting. Please make sure you register online via the link that is given also in the bulletin. There are a few more slots open for any women who may be interested in attending the Michigan Conference Women's Retreat. Uh, again, there's more information in the bulletin, but if you are interested in that, please go there and find that. And please keep our missionaries and the work in El Salvador in your prayers. You know, God is one who leads us, who, who goes before us and makes the way, and sometimes doors open and doors close, but we can always praise him that his will is being done. He will accomplish what he set out to do, and it doesn't matter what the enemy does to thought that he will not succeed especially uh, in the time that we find ourselves uh, living in and uh, as we transition now into our worship service, I want to comfort you with the words in Psalms 46. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease. And the end, to the ends of the earth, he breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Once again, it's repeated. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. This morning, our scripture reading is found in Psalms 98. Uh, if you are watching and if you are here, please let's stand as we read this passage. Psalms 98, we'll be reading the first four verses. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. 
Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that we receive each and every day. We know, Lord, that everything that we have and everything that we are is due to your interposition in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the angels which surround us, which help us, which protect us from a thousand evils. Lord, we pray, humble our hearts. Help us even in this time of, of distress and, and panic to have our eyes fixed and stayed on you. For we know that you do not move, regardless of if the mountains should be thrown into the sea, regardless of how much war and calamity there is, or if there's pestilence or famine on any number of evil things that may come our way. We know that you are our bulwark. You are our stronghold. You are our refuge. You shall not be moved. And as long as we are hidden in you, we have nothing to fear. Please be with our families, be with those who are affected by COVID-19 and the virus. Be with all those who are suffering from other diseases. Lord, we know that your original plan was for sickness and death to never even be part of the human story. I pray, Lord, give us confidence and help us to build our trust in you throughout this time. And may, as things settle down, Lord, may we have testimonies to share which will inspire others to have faith in you as well. Please be with us as we worship you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us. Remain standing if you're standing there at home for our opening song, number 330. Our story today takes place in the state of Minnesota. And Minnesota is west of Michigan. 
It has weather similar to Michigan, but sometimes it can be even colder and snowier than what we have in Michigan. Two brothers, John and Corey Hoffman, are dairy farmers down in southeastern Minnesota. And with their father, Greg, they manage a farm that's been in business for over a hundred years. And because it's a dairy farm, that means that they have cows on their farm and they're milking the cows. Last winter was especially hard on these farmers up in Minnesota. In one winter's day, as they were proceeding with their chores on taking care of the cows and feeding and milking them, part of the roof over their barn collapsed and fell in. It was below zero outside, the barn was opened up, and the cows were squished into a smaller, smaller space. It made things very difficult. The brothers thought, what are we going to do? Ah, well, we'll try and do what we can, but then a couple days later, another section of the roof fell in. Now they were in a real jam. They couldn't milk the cows. They couldn't feed the cows. They couldn't clean the manure out. How can they get out of this? What is their answer? They said, Lord, is this how you want us to end? We need help. Well, Corey's wife went on something called Facebook. It's on the computer, and Facebook is a way for it. It's like a big telephone system, but it's on the computer. And she put a little post on her Facebook page that said, here's our situation. We have to get these cows out of here. What can we do? And they didn't know it, but that started a chain of events. And that one little post got shared to this person and that person, and those people shared it, and they shared it. And while the Hoffmans were trying to figure out what to do, and even as they went to bed that night without an answer, that post went around 1,300 times. And were they surprised the next morning when look, they look out in their yard and they see a truck come up. Do you want to bring that up? First one truck with a trailer, people coming to help move the cows out of the barn. And then another one came, and another one came, one after another, till in five hours, all of their 450 cows were moved to safe new barns for them. There are two lessons we learned from this. The first is, when they had a time of difficulty where they didn't see an answer, they prayed to God. And they didn't know what would happen, but God already was putting the wheels in motion to help them out. And the second one is, Corey said, we couldn't have done this without the help of our friends and our neighbors and our community. And Jesus had given a lesson. He's, a man asked him, who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, he is the one who has a need. As we go through this week, we need to remember these things, and especially to be aware of those who have a need, that that's who we need to help and take care of. Let me pray with you. Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you're always ready. You're never caught by surprises. You always have an answer to our situation. Help us to trust in you, and help us to have ears that are attentive and open to when others have need and need help that we would respond like you would. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's now time for our offering. So this morning, something that strikes me is what a wonderful thing is to offer ourselves in physical presence when we can be together. That's not how this morning's worship service is. So you're watching from your home or in someone else's home as you've gathered to share the experience together. The other irony of this moment is that I was not supposed to be here, and most of you watching were. So God has turned that around. We're going to talk about that during the Sabbath school in our mission segment, why I'm here today with several other people and you're not. Uh, God is at work doing what He wills and wishes to be done. And as Pastor Andy mentioned in the Family Matters, God is not going to be stopped. 
And uh, I'm quite confident the way circumstances are turning out will be to his glory. And much more will get done than was originally planned to get done. The other unique uh, dynamic about this moment this morning is that this morning's offering, which we hope that you will make online, uh, it's easy to find on our website, whether you're a regular part of this uh, worshiping audience on Sabbath by Sabbath or whether you're watching from somewhere else, go online and make your offering. But if you're in this community and you're not familiar with how to do that or prefer not to, there will be someone at the church during regular office hours and you can bring those offerings by. We certainly don't want God's work to suffer because we have not gathered, especially in this day and age. But also along the lines of the ironic is that this morning's offering is for world budget and it's for media, Adventist World Radio and uh, our Hope Channel. So we are not taking direct advantage of those two ministries this morning, but we are supporting them even as we are benefited by this online offering that we can make. So for the, uh, the zigs and the zags and the detours that we go on relative to uh, this morning's worship service, one thing can be focused, our desire to support God's cause. And I can assure you, having just returned from a very short trip to El Salvador, that our money opens doors of opportunities. Uh, there were probably 40 people working on the El Salvador College, but if the money that came from this church had not gone before us, nothing would be happening. They have a volunteer spirit. They have gifts and skills. They're working on putting the foundation is, in, but it is our offerings that open the door for their volunteer spirit. Without the money, there wouldn't have been 40 or 50 people working there. And when that college is finally built, and we remember that we're part of a world church, and that this moment of gathering in America opens the door up for gatherings all around the world, folks, let's redouble down. Let's remember what Jesus said is true will come to be, and let us work while it's day, for the night comes when no man can work. But part of what opens the door up to work are our gifts. So let's economize in our own lives. Let's be frugal with ourselves so we can be generous with God's cause, for the time is coming when we'll face the last global crisis and our opportunity work will be done. That time is not yet. Adventist World Radio and our Hope Channel are where the offerings for this morning's global mission offering go. And by the way, as I mentioned last week, let's become faithful in systematically giving to our local combined budget, 4% is our goal, to our Michigan Advance Partners, 1% is our goal, and to the world budget with 1% to 2%. And may we make God's work strong even when we can't be here to celebrate his work that's going on. We by faith know it is and by choice make it happen. Let's pray for this offering. Lord, thank you for the many blessings that you bring to us, the opportunity to give. Most won't be giving today in personal presence of the deacons, but we're praying, Lord, for those that are, and we're praying for those at home that you'll bless them. May they teach their children about the value of supporting your work, and may they find joy in giving. For indeed, Paul reminded us that Jesus told us that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. So bless us this morning. To that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is coming from Matthew chapter 10, verse 40 to verse 42. And it reads, He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise loss, lose his reward. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. those that are able to kneel, please kneel with me. 
Those watching online, if you're able to kneel, let us kneel down and pray. Gracious, loving Father, we humbly bow before you this morning, realizing you are God and you still sit on the throne and that nothing happens without your knowledge. We thank you, Lord, for how you have blessed us this week. You've given us divine appointments. You've given us opportunity. You have spoken to our conscience. You have deepened conviction. You have rebuked us at times, Lord. You have chastised us. But it is for our good, because you are God and you are our Father, that seeks to bring us back into harmony with your kingdom so that one day we may see your face. We thank you for not letting us go astray, Lord, that you continue to send your angels and providences to turn us back into the path of righteousness for your name's sake. Forgive us, Lord, for we're <clears throat> where we have resisted your voice, where perhaps we have gone our own way and done our own thing, only to reap what we have sown. But we thank you for your mercy that endures forever as we cry out to you and turn our hearts back to you that you, Lord, are ready and good to forgive. This morning, Lord, we want to ask that you'll be with those that are in their personal homes watching online, that your spirit will come down upon them and that as they hear the message for today, they will hear your voice very distinct and clearly and that they, Lord, will be touched by your presence. I ask, Lord, that those that are sick, as Pastor Andy prayed earlier, be with them. May your hand be upon them. May your hand be upon your people to go forth from door to door and visit their neighbors to see their condition and what may be their need. Lord, as things continue to transpire and unfold, as it is written in Bible prophecy, help us take heart and courage, not to be fearful or anxious, but to look to you and ask for your guidance and strength to move forward and carry the gospel onward. And I'll ask that you be with Pastor Vine as he preaches the message this morning. Lord, may your spirit fill him, anoint his lips in a mighty way, and may his presentation be with power because of your presence. And now, Father, we praise you and we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, and through whom all the blessings we have received have flowed through him. Bless your name, O Lord. Revive your people and carry the work forward, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, ladies, for that lovely music. It uh, reminds me of my youth, or youth, when I was young. Uh, I had this um, very disturbing period in my life when my brother was learning to play the French horn, and I was learning to play the trombone. And uh, the most painful thing was carrying the thing to school every week, these huge, big um, cases. But uh, thank you very much just for that reminder of those beautiful hymns. <coughs> well, uh, good morning. Good morning, all of you who are online. I must say that uh, I'm probably, uh, it's probably a first for Village. I can claim to be the first person to preach Sabbath morning to 10 people at Village main service. Yeah, so that's a first. So um, <coughs> I don't know whether next week the preacher will be able to claim to have even emptied the church further. Let's see if they can beat what I've done. I've emptied it this much. But anyway, you know, it's, uh, it's a time when we need to reflect seriously about the times that we are living in. And if you don't mind, I would just like to start with a prayer. Uh, we had a, our pastoral prayer, but I'd like to lift up specifically the, the hearts of those who are being affected directly by coronavirus. And um, if you wouldn't mind just bowing your heads with me, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we know from your word that the end times will be times when people's hearts will fail them. We pray that we may have courage. We pray that we may be people of hope. And we pray that we may bind together, Lord, as a church, and that we will adapt to the changing circumstances, that the events that are transpiring around the world, Lord, will be a wake-up call for us, that we may recommit our lives to you, Lord, and uh, just affirm our faith in you and the great truths that you have given us in your word. Bless us now as we open your word. May it speak to us, we pray in your name. Amen. So, and I'm very pleased, I must say, I, you know, I appreciate all of you guys online, but I'm very pleased that I have a few to at least talk to. Uh, it sort of uh, humanizes the whole process. So, uh, my message this morning is entitled, Prophets to the Nations. And this morning, I would like to talk to you about your identity as Christians, one element in a previous sermon, I talked to you about your identity as righteous persons. And this morning, I would like to talk to you about your identity as prophets. We are all called, in a sense, to be prophets. Let me share some scriptures with you. Matthew 5, you know the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus there, he's really defining, he's talking to his Jewish audience, and he's defining the remnant of Israel, the faithful remnant. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in, in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then we come to verse 11. Blessed are are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account? Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And here Jesus is talking to his audience and he's saying, look, you're going to go through the same experience as the prophets who were before you. Think of yourselves as walking in the footsteps of the prophets. And which prophets are we talking about? The prophets of the Old Testament. If we go to our scripture reading at the end of chapter 10, Jesus there is talking to the twelve and he characterizes their experience as including a prophetic experience. Verse 11, whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet, that just means they welcome you as a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. So here again, he's characterizing the experience of his followers as having a prophetic element. I am calling you to be prophets. You need to integrate this into your understanding of what it means to be a follower of me. If we go to the end of the gospel, you see this is a consistent theme. In chapter 23, Jesus is talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and he tells them, I will send you prophets 
wise men or sages and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. So again, Jesus sees this prophetic movement, whether it's the crowds, those who listen to his teachings, whether it's the twelve, or and here he's not saying who it is, and we can assume that he's talking beyond the immediate audience to say, I'm going to send you a group, and this will include those who identify themselves as prophets. Really, he's speaking above the immediate audience, and he's speaking to us as readers of the text, and he's really appealing to us, will you go and be prophets today? Well, what does it mean to be a prophet? Our first answer would be to imitate Jesus, because Jesus was a prophet, and all the way through the gospel, and here we're just in Matthew, but we could do the same with the other gospels, we find that Jesus is a characterized as a prophet. In chapter 13, he's gone to his hometown in Nazareth, and there the crowds in the synagogue, they're astounded, the people in the synagogue, they ask, where did this man get this wisdom and these deeds of power? We'll see that these deeds of power are what prophets do. And then we've got this dialogue, and they, we find that they reject Jesus. And the point I want you to take is Jesus' response. But Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their own country and in their own house. And he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Jesus is talking about himself there, a prophet without honor. Not only here do we find Jesus as a prophet, but we find that others identify him as a prophet. In Matthew 21 verse 11, we find that there folks say, this is the prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, from Galilee. You remember in Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they identify John the Baptist, maybe Elijah, one of the prophets. They understand Jesus as a prophet. We find that Jesus dies as a prophet. He goes to Jerusalem, and in Matthew 23, he tells us that Jerusalem is the place, the city that kills the prophets. Consistent characterization. Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and there's many explanations we can give for why he died, but one of the explanations is, is that he went to suffer the prophet's death. So, this morning I would like to talk to you about what it means to be a prophet as a follower of Jesus. And I'm going to share three things this morning. The prophetic situation. When are prophet prophets called to come and minister. What does it mean to be a prophet? Where do we go as prophets and what are we to do? I would like to talk to you about the prophetic mindset. How are we to think as prophets? How would we understand how we relate to God as prophets? And then finally, the prophetic message. What is it that we're to share with others? What's the message that we are meant to share with others. So this morning, I would like to share with you the prophetic situation, the prophetic mindset, and the prophetic message. And before I start looking at the prophetic situation, maybe I could just make two points. And the first is this, is that there is a difference between preaching prophecy and being a prophet. There's a difference. Simply preaching prophecy doesn't make you into a prophet. Being a prophet requires that you are actually being used by God directly. It's not enough just to know prophecy, to be a prophet. And secondly, is that here in Matthew, prophecy is primarily not to the church. But prophecy is to the nation. It's a warning to the nation. We have a prophet, great prophet in our church, Sister White. And uh, she had both elements in her ministry. She spoke to the church, but she also spoke to the wider world and to her community. And this is something that we often forget. We think of prophecy primarily as something for the church, as inward looking. But no, 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 no. When we look at God's view of prophecy, yes, it can be to the church. But as we look here in the gospel, we find that prophecy is primarily something that we are called to do to the nation, which is why my title this morning is Prophets 
to the nations. So I would invite you this morning, as we go through this study, our study this morning, to reach out to the text, let the text speak to you, and let it shape your understanding of what God has called you to do and to be. And I would suggest to you that as you look at the events on your screens, on the news at the moment, that now is the time when we reaffirm our prophetic identity. Is that the world needs a clear voice. And that this morning, as we listen to God's word, I pray that he will refocus us so that we can reaffirm our identity as Seventh-day Adventists called for a unique time. This is the time when we should step up to the plate to the mission that God has given us. It's not some, a time for us to be fearful, to cower. Now is the time when the world needs a clear voice. So let us start by looking at the prophetic situation. And um, uh, I'm going to start by turning us back to the Old Testament. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to... First, uh, Second Chronicles, chapter 15, Second Chronicles, chapter 15. And uh, when we read the New Testament, it really makes sense when we turn to the Old Testament. That is the background, and we should never read one without the other. The New Testament builds on the Old Testament, but the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. And uh, when we read in the Gospel, we find that Jesus, he is someone who moves to somewhere, and then he leaves. He goes to another place, and then he leaves. He goes to a third place, he stays there for a while, and then he leaves. And we find that his presence is mobile. And I would suggest to you that when we look at Matthew, much of the language in Matthew reflects Old Testament language. And I would suggest to you that when we go to Second Chronicles 15, this helps us understand what is going on in the gospel. We have a prophet speaking to the king of Judah. His name is Asa. And I'm going to read chapter 15, verses 1 down to 4. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Obed. He's not a prophet we talk much about but here he is, he's a prophet, Azariah, son of Obed. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. And here's the condition. The Lord is with you. And what's the condition? While you are with him. You need to underline this. This is such an important principle that we need to take on board. The Lord is with you, but it's a conditional presence. The Lord is with you while you are with him. And now he unpacks it. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, what will he do? He will abandon you. Let me read this again. It's too often we skip through these texts. But no, the principle is, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, what's going to happen? You will find him. Where have you heard that in the gospel? Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and what will you, you will receive. Seek, and what will happen? you will find. I would suggest to you that when you, when you read Chronicles, it is full of seeking language. Search for the Lord, and he, you will find him. And when you find him, he will return to you, and he will be with you. It's throughout the surrounding chapters. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. You, he will be found by you. There's the good news. But the warning is, if you abandon him, what is he going to do? What is he going to do? He will abandon you. Now you read that. This is, both has great hope, but also it's a shocking verse. Yes? And this is, I would suggest, the dynamics that shapes God's relationship with Israel in much of the Old Testament. When Israel moves closer to God, what happens? God moves closer to Israel. But 
When the nation backs away from God, what does this text tell us that God will do? He will step back. Think of it like a dance. Israel, we read in the Old Testament, is described in Ezekiel, he describes Israel as a bride, a beautiful bride. And Yahweh comes along and takes this bride and gets married to her. And imagine that they're having a beautiful romantic dance together. This this beautiful bride, Israel, who's been restored, showered presents upon her by uh, by her husband, and they're dancing together. But then Israel decides to step back, to break away from her dance partner. What does the dance partner do? Honors her choice, and he too steps back. The nation steps back away from God, and God steps back from the nation. And you cannot escape this dynamic. Our spiritual experience is influenced by the spiritual temperature of the nation that we live in. We cannot escape it. We're doing in Sabbath school the book of Daniel at the moment. Daniel, was he a particularly rowdy, disobedient young chap? There's no evidence in it. But what happens to him? He's taken as a young man, and I'm sure that Daniel learnt his memory verses. He's taken to Babylon. Why? Not because of anything he did, but because of his nation. He suffered personally because his nation stepped back from God. Or you think of those times in Israel's history when Israel was spiritually close to God. Maybe think about the peak of Israel under King, maybe King David, we might say, and maybe into part of Solomon's reign, when Israel reached its zenith. Does that mean that there were no dishonest people in Israel? No liars? Those who maybe just oh, went with the flow but weren't that committed? No. There were bad people when God blessed Israel. And they experienced the blessings despite their spiritual state. They rode the wave of the nation. And we cannot escape the dynamics of the nation and God within our personal experience. When a nation steps back from God, breaks away from her dance partner, what does God do? He steps back. We cannot escape from the dynamics between God and the nation. And we need to take this into account. It affects our own spiritual experience. Jesus, in Matthew 10, verse 11 to 15, he tells the disciples there that when they enter into a town, if the town accepts them, he says, whenever you enter, find out who it is in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. Go and spend time there. Do not leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. He's telling you that you need to be mobile. Jesus disengaged from towns that reject him. Jesus heard about what happened to John the Baptist in Matthew 14, and he disengaged. He left the towns. You read the chapters 14, 15, and 16, and Jesus almost never goes into a town. The towns have rejected him, and he backs away. What did Second Chronicles tell us? If you are with the Lord, he is with you. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, what will he do? He will abandon you. Jesus comes into a town. If they accept him, he will sit down and he will stay there until you refuse him. He's not going to go anywhere. His presence is dependent upon how the town receives him. If they refuse him, he brushes the dust off his feet and he leaves. And so it is that in some towns we can say, God is there, 
And in other towns, God has left. Jesus has left. Now, I tell you this, this just makes, a, <clears throat> here I need to share, you know, a little, I don't know whether we could classify this as the genre of personal testimony, but this dynamic really helps me make sense of my own spiritual experience. So I've grown up in, in the UK. Now, UK has a great tradition, Christian tradition, Protestant tradition, where we've had many, many faithful souls over the generations. But as I've grown up, you can see that the nation led by the elite are essentially turning their backs on God. The nation is disengaging, stepping back from God. Well, what do, do the verses tell us God will do in response? He will step back from the nation. You know, I, I listen to podcasts while I'm walking. You know, I try and walk every day, get my exercise. Yes, you know, so I, I gave up rugby when I was about eight. And since then, walking is, is what I do. So go on my walks, I listen to podcasts, and one, of, one podcast uh, series is called Unbelievable. They get debates going on between a believer, maybe a scientist or a historian, and a non-believer. And uh, as you listen to those guys who are non-believers, their arguments typically rest on the assumption that there is no evidence for God. They look at the world around, they look at nature, and they say there is no evidence for God. And, and you're scratching your head and thinking, how can this be? And then the penny dropped for me. Yes. For them, there is literally no evidence for God. Why? Because what have they done? They've stepped back from God. And what has God done? He's stepped out of their town. He stepped out of their city. Now, he's left, left his fingerprints there. He's left a witness. But he has, there's less of, them, of God in the unbeliever's world than in the world of the believer. How is it that as you travel, and I've done enough traveling where I'd like to give up travel, yes? But how is it that when you go to different countries, they have such different spiritual atmospheres? When I was um, just after university, I went to Poland for two years as a student missionary. And there it was 95% Catholic. And up to 50% of the population was in church on Sunday. Imagine that, 50% of the population. And I was teaching, and I'm teaching young people who, when you talk about Moses, they know who you're talking about. When you talk about David, they know who you're talking about. There was a spiritual atmosphere in the culture, which was a complete shock to me coming from the UK. Different cultures seem to have different spiritual experience, uh, atmospheres. And it may be that, as we see in Second Chronicles, that we as prophets are being sent into a situation where God has stepped back out of the city, out of the nation. It means we may be living in a nation in which God's presence is less today than it was 50 years ago. Just imagine that. We're living in an environment where it's harder for us to say, look, there's God's presence, there's God's presence, there's God's presence. It's harder for us. Not because we're not praying enough, not because we're not reading our Bible enough, but because our experience is shaped by the nation in which we live. And we cannot, experience, uh, we cannot escape that dynamic. Well... Before we look at our own experience, what about the prophets that Jesus was sending out? The 12, they were to be prophets. When he sent them out into Israel, what was the situation of the nation that he was sending them? Too often we think when we're reading about uh, uh, first century uh, <clears throat> Judea, Palestine, that Judaism back then was really just a religion of legalism. Yeah. And Jesus came along basically to tell them to lighten up and to experience a bit of grace and everything will be okay. No, 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 no. The situation when Jesus walked this earth was far more serious than simply legalism. Now, if you look at Matthew 23, verse 28, here he's talking to the leaders of the nation and uh, as priest-like people, as people like priest. And there in Matthew 23, 
Verse 28, he says this. Let me read from verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are all are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So, that you, so you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and, what else? Lawlessness. Now I've got some other verses there. Matthew uh, 7 and Matthew 13. And if you go there, I've got New Revised Standard Version. And there it, um, it doesn't use the term lawlessness. Yeah, it says evildoers. But you, when you read in Greek, evildoers, the Greek word that underlines that is anomia. It's lawless ones. And throughout the gospel, Jesus characterizes Israel's problem not as legalism, but the opposite. It's lawlessness. Now we might ask, what does he mean by lawlessness? And I would suggest to you that it doesn't mean that there's an absence of law. There are thousands of laws that they have. It's not the absence of law that Jesus is dealing with, but rather I would suggest a more serious problem. It's where the nation has entered into a state where they're in rebellion with God. I mean, here, you know, as, um, since we've moved to the U US, we're, we're learning US history. And um, what I've seen, and you can correct me during the break, but the American Constitution was set up to have separate church and state. That was the idea. And it was set up to have small government. Why? Because of what those, the nasty King of England was doing. Yep. But the assumption was, was that people would have their own internal laws to self-regulate themselves. That they would have their own values. That they would be men and women of principle. What happens when you stop governing yourself internally is that you become lawless, and so what does the government need to do? To step in with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little regulations which are really on the surface hiding an underlying problem where the nation is at heart lawless. This is the problem of Israel in the gospel. It's a problem of lawlessness rather than legalism. When Jesus arrives in Israel, the first, after his baptism, the first person, if we can call him a person that he encounters, is Satan. And he's tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. And then as he goes throughout Israel, he encounters person after person after person who is demonically, <clears throat> what word am I using for? Possessed, demonically possessed. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Now, you know, when you read the Old Testament, you don't get so many de demon-possessed people. So how do we read these stories? Where have all these demon-possessed people come from? And I would suggest to you that really what the gospel writers want us to think is that Jesus is going into Israel, and who is claiming ownership of it? Satan. And he's got his, his underlings out there ruling his kingdom. In the same way that when you read in the Old Testament, Israel, when she turned away from God, she didn't become agnostic. She simply started worshipping other gods. The demons are in effect, we should read these as evidence that Israel actually is in a state of idolatry. That's how I would suggest we are to read these stories. Matthew 11 Jesus has been witnessing to the cities of Galilee, and they rejected. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with, with me to chapter 11, verse 23. And Jesus there is talking to the cities. Notice how the, the state of the cities affects the experience of the individual. There in verse 23, he says this, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. What does that remind you of? Will you be exalted to heaven? No, you're going to be brought right down to Hades. I would suggest to you that that is an allusion to 
Isaiah and to Ezekiel who talk about the king of Babylon and Sidon as those princes, Lucifer, who exalts himself, but then the Lord brings him down. It is hubris, trying to be more than God has created you to be, and then he brings you down, and this is the state of Capernaum. They are being compared to Babylon. Quite something. This is the prophetic situation. Jesus, Matthew 6, you know this, but uh, let's just push the implications a little far further. Jesus warns us that we cannot to serve two masters. He says you cannot serve mammon and God. And often we skip through that verse, but hang on. What does it mean to serve in the Old Testament? Whenever you see the term serve, it's usually when the Lord is saying, you need to serve me rather than serving false gods. Jesus is warning Israel about idolatry. Legalism is not the problem. It's far more serious than that. And then finally, Israel's situation. Israel suffers from what I would suggest to you is idolatry sickness. Yeah, I mean, when I read other Jewish literature from the time of the Gospels, yeah, so maybe 100 years before, 100 years after, you don't get so many sick people as you get in the Gospels. Wherever Jesus goes, there are sick people. He goes from one city, they bring out the sick. Goes to another, they're sick. When he's walking through a city out, there's sick people by the side of the road. You don't get this emphasis in other Jewish literature. Why this emphasis? I would suggest to you that we need to read these stories theologically. And uh, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me. I've got some texts here. You can look them up later. But Psalm 115. Let's go to Psalm 115. This gives us an incredibly important spiritual principle that we need to bear in mind when we're reading about Jesus' ministry. And here the psalmist is talking about idols. He's describing idols. And then at the end of the passage, he gives us a little spiritual principle that I want you to take note of. Verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not where have I got? They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not fe feel, feet but do not walk. They make no sounds in their throats. So here he's describing the idols that are made. And then here is the principle. Verse 8, those who make them, what comes next? I like them. You make idols, what happens to you? You become like the thing you worship. So are all who trust in them. And you can read Isaiah 6, yeah, other passages in the Old Testament prophets where they talk about talking to Israel, but you're blind, you're deaf. Yeah, and if I say anything, it's going to make you more deaf. Jesus actually quotes the passage in, Psalm, uh, in Matthew 13. And the principle is this, is that if you worship something who can't see, what happens to you? You become blind. If you worship something who can't hear, what happens to you? You become deaf. If you worship something that can't walk around, you become lame. And I would suggest to you that when you read the Gospels, Jesus is always healing the blind, the de de deaf, the dumb, and the lame. It's never rheumatoid arthritis. It's not the flu. Yeah, but I'm sure they had these things in the ancient world. We know from, I don't know, two, uh, 1000, 2000 BC, we've got records from Egypt where they're talking about cancer. We know they had cancer. Jesus isn't dealing with those things. He's dealing with people who, it's almost like stereotypical illnesses which remind you, if you listen to the text we've just read, of those who worship idols. 
Jesus told a parable. He talked about a house where there was an unclean spirit. Jesus came along and he cast that spirit out. The house is clean. But the householder didn't put anything good into the house. What happened? The unclean spirit was wandering through the wilderness, found seven other unclean spirits and brought them in. And now the situation of that house is worse than it was. Jesus is describing his ministry. He's coming to Israel and Israel is in a state of idolatry, full of demonic presence, full of Satan's presence. And Jesus comes into this situation and he sends out prophets. When a nation steps back from God, what does God do? He steps back from the nation. Nature abhors a vacuum. Others fill in. I mean, this is a terrifying situation to think that you're being sent into that house. Our situation, I would suggest, our experience living here in the West is that we are experiencing many uh, there's a lot of evidence that there's those who are stepping back from God and it affects our spiritual experience. Our situation, I would suggest to you, is one in which we rejoice that nobody tells us what to think. We've stepped back from God and now we can be total gods. We can think what we want and do what we want. We can choose our own behavior. The problem is, is that this comes at a great cost. You know, I'm teaching a class at the seminary at the moment, Greek or Roman background. Yeah, this is a little, uh, just a, a little aside. In the ancient world, some of the most dangerous people were the atheists. The atheists. Yeah, let, let me explain how it worked. So, we know that in the Bible, Jerusalem was holy land. And if Israel was faithful to God, what would God do? Bless Israel. And so, you would, if you were an Israelite, you would care about what your fellow Israelite thought. Is my fellow Israelite going to church this morning? If not, it's not just his life he's affecting, who else is he affecting? He's affecting the community. And so, we take care of each other. Why? Because what you do matters. You could anger the gods <laughs> and if the gods are angry, it affects me. So I take an interest in you. That's how the Roman theology worked. The Romans, they believed that Rome was holy land, the, the actual city of Rome. Yeah, soldiers weren't allowed to bring swords in. They were kept kicking out foreign gods, Egyptian Temples were being closed down all the time, and then springing up and then kicked out again and again and again. And the theory was this, is that if we worship Goddess Roma and keep the show going as she wants it, she will be pleased and she will bless the Roman Empire. We've got to watch how people worship in Rome, because if they anger the Goddess Roma, what is she going to do? She might withdraw her pleasure and her favor to the empire, and the empire will suffer. In such situation, you always care about what your neighbor thinks. And then along comes the atheist who says, hey, we don't believe in Roma. We don't believe her. <gasps> whoa, 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 whoa. These people are so dangerous because how is Roma going to respond to atheists? Is she going to be pleased? No. She's going to be angry. And that doesn't just affect the atheist, it affects the whole community. We have stepped, as we step back from God, people want to do whatever they want to do, but this comes, I would suggest, at a cost. It comes where people stop caring about others. No longer interested. You want to believe what you believe? Sure. I don't care what you believe. Believe whatever you want. But it comes at the cost of insignificance. You can think whatever you want, but nobody cares. That's why I would suggest to you 
We are suffering a pandemic, not just of coronavirus, but of loneliness. We live in a spiritual situation where we've disengaged from God and the end result is insignificance. Nobody cares. You're living in a theological mindset where nobody cares what you believe. Yeah. Uh, we also, when we disengage from God, it lowers the expectations of what a good life is. When you are dancing with the Lord, Scripture tells us that you experience life more abundant. I mean, who knows what your life is? Your life, the good life, is actually in the mind of God, and He is creating you day by day into a new creature. His vision for your life is more than you can ever dream. That's what it's like when you're dancing with the Lord. You're dancing with Him and He's teaching you new steps and new dances. Let me take you into this dance and into this dance. He's got a vision for you which would blow your mind. When you disengage from God, what have you got? You've got your bucket list of things to do before you die. Our expectations of the good life reduces. Now it's you making it up instead of your dance partner. See, you know, that, that's, that's a real problem for me coming from England, you see. See, I don't go out to restaurants. Yeah, now, you know, obviously there's the financial reason, but here's the other reason, is that back in the UK we had fish and chip shops, okay? I've eaten fish and chips. When I eat fish and chips, I'm the happiest man on earth. Yeah, haddock and chips with salt and vinegar. It means I go to a nice Italian restaurant here and I get my food and what am I thinking of? Fish and chips. I'm permanently in a state of disappointment. Permanent disappointment. Yeah? When you've done your bucket list, what is left? We're suffering from low expectations. You disengage from the dance and what have you got in life? Maybe a foreign holiday to look forward to until the planes are cancelled. What have you got? Yeah, maybe I can just get through this life without too many serious illnesses, live till I'm 80, 85, and then go out with a bang. Lower expectations. When we step back from God, what does He do? He steps back from the nation, and our expectations of what a good life is are reduced. Yeah. How do we understand time and space? It changes when we step back from God. Time before, when we're, when we're dancing with the Lord in this dance, nation and God, time is something that God is shaping. He explains the past for us. He tells us what His plans are for the future. The past and the future have great significance. You step back and all you've got is your new Apple Watch. That's all you've got. You've got time. You've got hours, minutes and seconds racing by, but they have no significance. And space changes. Instead of living in a world which is part of God's wonderful creation that shouts His glory and declares His name, we're just living in an ecosystem where you are no better than a monkey or a dog. Nothing has significance. Israel stepped back from the Lord, the Lord stepped back from Israel, and who goes into the vacuum in between? The prophet. The prophet steps in, and not into a safe environment, no, into an environment where demons have stepped in into that vacuum. That, I would suggest, is the prophetic situation. Jesus did not need, God did not in the Old Testament need to send Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel to Israel if Israel had been close to the Lord. He sends the prophet into a dysfunctional spiritual state. That's the prophetic situation where Satan has been let off his lead and the demons are inhabiting that, that house. 
It takes someone, I would suggest to you, of great courage to be a prophet. They are no longer thinking about their own spiritual experience, but they are thinking about the spiritual state of others rather than of themselves. The prophetic mindset. Let me share with you briefly what it means to think like a prophet. <clears throat> if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. And uh, we have Matthew 10, verse 19. Before I read it, let me just talk to you a little as to why this is significant, this verse. Verses 19 and, 10, uh, and 20. James Kugel, he's, I think he's a professor over at Harvard. Now, he's Jewish. He wrote a book, The Great Shift, where he simply, looking at the Old Testament, he describes how individuals going through the Old Testament story experience God. And his basic argument is, is that as you go through the Old Testament, they had different experiences of God. So, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh talked to them directly, and they talked with Yahweh. When you come to Joseph, Joseph never speaks directly with God. Never. His experience of God is very different from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Instead, for Joseph, he goes into these situations and they seem chaotic. He's sold as a slave. Hey, that shouldn't happen. He's put in prison for something he hasn't done. Oh, that shouldn't happen. And yet, it always seems to work out right. And for Joseph, James Google says, God is sort of the long-term planner who plans ahead. So although he doesn't speak direct and have a face-to-face -face conversation with Yahweh like Abraham may have had, nevertheless God is present in his situation. He suggests, Google, that we in the West... Yeah, he calls it the weird world. Well, he's taken this from others. And weird simply means Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. W-E-I-R-D, the weird world. We're about 12% of the world's population. And he says, our spiritual experience in the weird world is very different from those outside the weird world. He says, those outside the weird world have what he calls semi-permeable selves. Their mind, how they think, they assume that their minds are open to outside influences, that outside influences can come in and out. Whereas in the West, we think of our minds as a self-concealed box and nothing can get in. We're impermeable. I've just got my thoughts and I can control them and nobody else knows them. That's the weird world mentality. And I would suggest to you that the prophetic mindset is more like the 88% of the world rather than our 12%. If we read in Matthew 10, verses 19 to 20, this is what Jesus says. When they hand you over... And this is because you're doing your prophetic ministry. When they hand you over, do not worry about what you are to speak. Oh, you should be worried about whether they're going to hurt you. No. Am I going to survive this? No. The prophet doesn't worry about those things. The prophet might worry about goodness. Am I going to say the right things that the Lord wants me to say? And he says, do not worry about these things about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you at that time. Here is a description of the prophetic mindset, the prophetic experience. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That is a classic description of how the prophet suddenly becomes the mouthpiece of the Spirit of the Father. Who is speaking? It's not my words, but the Spirit is speaking through me. The Spirit of the Father is speaking through me to the leaders of the nation, according to that verse. 
It means that I've got to have a mindset where I'm continually thinking, not my thoughts, but thy thoughts, O Lord. Lord, give me a message today. Lord, it's not just enough for me to have known my Bible and to have studied and done all my studies and be immersed in his word, but I've got to have a moment by moment, Lord, I know my scripture, I know the great truths that you've revealed, but what is the message you need today? Scripture says many things, and you could use one message inappropriately in, in a certain context. It's not just enough to preach, preach Scripture. You've got to preach the right Scripture. You've got to preach the message that God wants at that moment. And how do you know it's the right message? God has to speak to you and tell you. The prophetic mindset is one where our minds are open. We're constantly seeking, Lord, day by day, moment by moment, what is the message you want me to deliver? Semi-permeable mindsets. <clears throat> I had to put this quote in. Ken, in our fireside Sabbath school. Ken, if you're online, I want to thank you for this quote. He gave me this quote. It summarizes perfectly what it's like to be a prophet. Already the judgments of God are abroad in the land, as seen in storms, in floods, in tempests, in earthquakes, in peril by land and by sea. At this time, we must, and just the imagery here is just mind-blowing, at this time we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. You are in a situation which is cold. The nation has stepped back. God has stepped out. It's spiritually cold, and somehow you get warmth from the coldness, courage from their cowardice, loyalty from their treason. You're in that situation of spiritual desperateness. Don't worry what you're going to say. Don't worry. The Spirit will give you the words. Don't worry. We need to have this open mindset, semi-permeable self, seeking the Lord's message at that moment that we are in. So let me come to a conclusion by talking about the prophetic message. We looked at the situation. God steps, the nation steps back from God. God steps back from the nation. But his presence now is the prophet in this dangerous spiritual situation where demons run amok, but there is a prophet standing there whose mind is open and God's presence, even though he stepped back from the nation, is now coming through the prophet to the nation. What should the prophet say? And here we have the message of the prophet. I would suggest to you that the prophet needs to share both hope and warning good news and bad news. If the prophet only preaches bad news, you find that the audience turns off very, very quickly. A prophet needs to both tell the nation, this is what will happen if you turn back to God. Imagine what will happen if the nation turns back to God. We need to have a positive vision for the nation as well as simply warning them that this is what will happen if things don't change. It's not enough just to be doom mongers. We have to give a positive vision of what a nation can achieve when it walks with its Lord. Let me just go through four prophetic messages we find in the gospel. If you've got your, your um, Bibles open, turn back to Matthew. And um, I must you'll trust me that these two verses are saying the same thing. Let's go to Matthew 4 verse 17. This is Jesus' opening line as a preacher to the nation. From that time on, Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What is the call? Repent. And all repent means is return. Return back. What was the message of John the Baptist? Repent. What are the disciples to preach in Matthew 10? Repent. This is the basic message of the preacher, of the prophet. When they go into a situation where the nation has stepped back, the invitation is very, very simple. Return. And what will happen? Seek and you will find. 
Repent, return. That is, in one word, the opening message of the prophet. Return to the Lord. And it's not just nations that need to do that do this. It's individuals. As I'm speaking this morning, maybe there are individuals who've stepped a little too far away from their Lord. They know that they've disengaged. What is the message? Return. Seek and you will find. You will enter back into that beautiful dance with your creator and savior. And then we need to give that vision of what will happen when you return. And we find this, time doesn't permit us, but Matthew 8 and 9, we have three miracles and then three miracles and then three miracles. Matthew has gathered them together and he refers to them later in his gospel as deeds of power, prophetic deeds of power. The prophet, as I mentioned, needs to give a vision of what happens when you return to the Lord. When you return to the Lord, he takes the blindness caused by idolatry, whatever you are worshipping, and you have become, you become what you worship, and he starts to remove the effect of that idolatry. The nation returns to the Lord and is renewed. The prophet needs a positive message as well as simply warnings of judgment, deeds of power. And then we come to chapter 11. And the warning is this, is that the prophet is going into a dangerous situation and the prophet has a message which nine times out of ten the nation does not want to hear. The prophets are always associated with persecution. Why is that? Because they're going into a cold, dangerous situation and they're giving a message, return and change, and people don't like to hear that message. And when they refuse that invitation to return, the prophet needs to turn the volume up a little more, to warn a little stronger. And this is what we have in chapter 11, verse 20, reading from verse 10, 20. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you! Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the deeds of power, those are all the miracles of chapter 8 and 9, done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. These are the woes of the prophets of the Old Testament. He's saying, you are just reaching the last chance saloon. And we read in the gospel that they still ignore the prophetic appeal. So Jesus, what he does then, these are the, this, is, this is the last card the prophet can, can play. When the prophet can't speak directly anymore, their eyes, they see but they do not see, they hear but they do not hear. Then the prophet has to change. Can't use direct words. Instead, the prophet uses parables, chapter 31, to the crowds, and in chapters 20 and 21, to the leaders of Jerusalem. The parable, they're just nice stories. Just nice stories. They're final uh, appeals, and whoever has an ear, let him listen. It's the final appeal, couched in gentle language, in the hope, the hope, that someone will be finally influenced. That's the final card a prophet can, can play. So we have looked this morning of the prophetic situation. Nation steps back from God. God steps back from the nation. <laughs> Satan and his hordes come into the middle. And the prophet comes along <laughs> and says, Look, mate, you're dancing, but not with your Lord and maker. You're dancing with Satan ultimately. <laughs> I need you <laughs> to leave your current da dance partner and return to the Lord. What a message. Is it any wonder that persecution and prophets go hand in hand? This is an identity which is polarizing. 
It's a Christian presence which comes in and doesn't just sit back and worry about the nine to five issues of life. This is a mindset which is willing to risk everything. Lives. It's a short-term mindset in one sense. Walter Brueggemann, he's uh, an American Old Testament scholar. He's worth reading. We've written some great work, Walter Brueggemann. He wrote a book, Peace, and he describes two types of Christians. He describes Western Christians he characterizes as having a theology of celebration for the haves, those in the rich world. Yeah. And their mindset is something like this. Yeah. We have everything we need. And so when we come along to church, we want to celebrate God for his good management of this universe. Why? Because we've received all the blessings we could ever want. And we don't want the world to change. We want things to be maintained as they are because we're the ones who are benefiting from the world as it is. And we come along and we celebrate God for all the blessings that he has done. Now, should we celebrate God? We should. Of course we should. But when this becomes the dominant motif of our Christian life, without thinking of the other things that we've been called to do, then there is a problem. A theology of celebration for the haves. And then in the rest of the world, which may, be not, may not have so many physical blessings, those who are suffering, whether it's for lack of basic necessities, he says in this part of the world, theology tends to be explaining why suffering occurs and how to survive it. It's a theology for the have-nots. Very different theology, depending on where you live. I would suggest to you that we need to add a third. Is that we need a theology of warning, a prophetic theology. And we as Adventists, we have been called to this commission. We have called not simply to proclaim, Lord, maintain things as they are. That's not our purpose. We shouldn't be fearful of change. The prophet comes into a situation that is imperfect and the prophet is trying to change things. Do you remember Robin Williams, the actor? You remember, I think it was 2004, he committed suicide. Yeah. And I read in one write-up in the newspaper a, a reflection on why it is that so many comedians commit suicide or get depressed. Now, why is it? And the explanation was this, is that comedians look at the world and they see the imperfections in the world and they want to change it. Now, that's not my personality. I got up in the morning open the windows and I just think, whoa, Lord, another great day. I'm happy. That's my personality type. I'm chirpy. I'm cheerful. Something's wrong? Don't worry about it. Just carry on. Yeah, a smile gets you a long way in life. The comedian looks at that same world and sees suffering, sees injustice. And the prophet is like that. A prophet sees the distance between God and the nation. And the prophet hasn't got a theology of celebration. The prophet has a theology of distance. It's a hard thing psychologically to be a prophet. It's a hard thing. A theology of suffering. A theology of the prophet is not simply to relieve suffering. Why? Because the prophet is going into a situation where the prophet may be causing his or her own suffering. I would suggest that this theology of the prophetic identity transcends maintenance. It transcends suffering. It calls us above all 
to be faithful to the voice of our Father in heaven. Do not worry what you are to speak or say. The words will be given to you. My challenge to you today is when you see the events going on in this world around is not to lose courage, but to realize that God needs a prophetic movement who will call nations back to him. If, as you've been listening to my message this morning, you've been overwhelmed, oh, that's not for me, I can't do that, Lord, then I would suggest that you are ideal to fulfilling this mission. Moses, I need you to go to Egypt. <gasps> not me, Lord. I can't do it. I'll send Aaron with you. Isaiah, I need you to go and give a warning message. Not me, Lord. My lips are the lips of a sinner. Jeremiah, I need you to go with a message. Not me, Lord. I'm too young. If the challenge I've given to you this morning feels overwhelming, praise God. You have the heart that is ideal for the Lord to take and shape into that of a prophet. My prayer is, is that we as a church will give the call that God needs to this nation, to this world, at this time, and that we will rise to the challenge. May we be faithful to the commission, to the call that God placed on the hearts of our pioneers. May we be faithful to His word, and we be faithful to his spirit's guiding as we face this world around us. Do not lose courage. Rise to the challenge and experience that prophetic ministry for the world needs us. To him be the glory and to him be the praise. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn will be hymn number 373. Those of you here, please stand. Oh. 
Let us bow our heads as we pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, may you use us as your instruments to bring those who've wandered back into your fold. May we be faithful to this calling that you've placed upon our hearts to be prophets for you, whether it's in our homes, in our workplaces, and to our nation. And if maybe, Lord, some of us have wandered away ourselves, may we return to you in the knowledge that we will find you and that we will be able to enter into that dance with you once more, where you will raise our sights as to what your potential is for our lives, that you may transform us to be like you, Lord. This is our prayer this morning. In your name, amen. There will be music playing here in our sanctuary for a few moments and then we will begin with our sabbath school we'll have a feature that relates to the very shortened trip by the el salvadorian missionaries and then we will go into a very interesting panel discussion on faith and presumption in a time of crisis so enjoy the beautiful music for a few moments and we will be transitioning shortly to our sabbath school <laughs> 